Okay, so welcome everybody. So in continuation with the psychosexual lecture series, uh, today we are going to learn about paraphilias. So just a revision. Yesterday we had gone into psychosexual disorders, but those disorders were according to the cycle. So if we want to divide sexual disorders into three parts, one will be uh, yesterday's psychosexual disorders according to the cycle then paraphilias and gender identity disorders so today we are going to do paraphilias and the next lecture will be on the third one that is the gender identity and other issues so let's uh, get into paraphilias so paraphilias are yes considered abnormal or a disorder but just like anything in uh, sexual disorders what is considered as an unusual abnormal behavior is very difficult to define like a lot of unconventional sexual behaviors do happen but if it is between two consensual adults there is no distress no problem then it might not be cause, called as abnormal so that is why uh, defining abnormality is the most important thing especially in psychiatry normal and abnormal uh, have to be distinguished very very clearly so Abnormal means those disorders or that behavior is rare, then it deviates from the cultural norms, so it is uh, out of keeping with the cultural norms, then uh, it should cause discomfort, discomfort either to the patient or to the partner, then uh, causes some inefficiency, so uh, they are not satisfied or they are not able to have proper uh, sexual intercourse. Uh, some paraphilias are just bizarre so that is also a criteria and it cause harm to self or others so these are the set criteria which uh, help us in defining abnormal sexual behaviors and uh, in keeping with that paraphilias are defined according to dsm-4 so dsm is a diagnostic and statistical manual so that is used for diagnosing all mental illnesses and uh, in paraphilias dsm4 says that it is a mental disorder in which there is recurrent intense sexual urges uh, or sexually arousing fantasies or behavior okay so this is one criteria that uh, it should be recurrent it should be uh, intense and there are sexual urges. What are these urges? We'll see in the next point. But this should be present at least for six months. So one or two episodes is not considered abnormal. It should be persistent. It should be recurrent. And this should be going on at least for six months. Now these uh, sexual urges or uh, sexual arousal can involve uh, either a non-human object or it can involve suffering or humiliation of oneself or one's partner. We'll be seeing what these definitions are, but just go through the criteria once. And the third uh, involves children or other non-consenting people. And the person has to act upon these urges. Just these urges are not enough. There should be some action. Or if the patient is not acting on them, there should at least be distress by them. And uh, like all uh, psychiatric illnesses, there should be clinically significant difference or distress in a social, occupational and other impairments uh, or other areas of life should also be impaired. So there should be some social disruption or some occupational disruption which was not there before and which is being caused by these sexual urges. So, uh, when we want to talk about paraphilias, we have included a few common ones. There are some other uncommon ones also, but we'll just see what usually is seen uh, in our OPD. So, focus of sexuality is on something or someone other than a consenting adult. So, this focus can be uh, like we have seen a non-human object or children or uh, involving some a cause of distress so we have fetishism voyeurism and exhibitionism transvestic fetishism then we have satism and masochism 
then rape is also included here uh, in some uh, books and some articles then pedophilia and incest is the last so what is fetishism fetishism is basically sexual attraction to a non living object so they get uh, aroused or sexual arousal occurs due to some non living object so it can be shoes or undergarments and voyeurism and exhibitionism is uh, like voyeurism is observing individuals in a state of undress without their knowledge so these are called as peeping tom and exhibitionism is the opposite it involves exposing oneself to strangers and both these have a thrill seeking component or the patient uh, gets a thrill or an arousal out of doing these things so first let's uh, see what all of these are then we'll go into detail so transvestic fetishism is a uh, sexual arousal uh, like sexual as arousal is occurring by the act of cross dressing so the patient uh, cross dresses and then gets sexual arousal due to this spouses are often quite supportive in these cases uh, sadism and masochism so sadism it involves sexual excitement by hurting others and masochism involves sexual uh, excitement when they are getting hurt so it is the opposite of sadism and a wide range of activities are involved in this so it is a continuum but uh, mostly like whenever a hurt is involved it can be sadism and masochism and uh, some people or some uh, psychiatrists considered rapists as a subset of sadism and they do meet the criteria for paraphilias also pedophilia is sexuality focused on children and can involve either or both sexes and now uh, because of the awareness in child abuse uh, these cases are coming up and it has a long term impact on both men and women so uh, treating this or focusing on this are uh, very very important and it will help in uh, bettering the society also and what is seen is all these uh, paraphilias are seen mostly in men so there is a lot of speculation as to why only men have these uh, tendencies or uh, probably something to do with testosterone but the etiologies are there now coming to fetishism so fetishism we have seen that a patient has some attraction to a non human object now this can be a mild preference so it may or may not be uh, there during the sexual activity they can have strong preference also but then they are able to have sexual intercourse without that object also but if it becomes a necessity that they need uh, like uh, if uh, they have fetishism for boots or shoes so they need shoes uh, during the sexual act otherwise they can't uh, have arousal and sometimes it's a substitute for humans so they don't need a partner or they don't need anything they just need that object so again like shoes so they just need that object for the sexual act to occur so if it becomes a necessity if it becomes a substitute for humans then it is considered abnormal so a mild preference or strong preference is normal uh, it's nothing to worry or it's not even a paraphilia but if it is a necessity then it becomes abnormal in uh, fetishism sexual arousal occurs either solely or predominantly with a non living object and this object is usually uh, intimately associated with a human body and the word fetish means magical so the non living object magically becomes phallic or sexual for that person and this disorder again exclusively seen in males most disorders you will see is seen uh, mostly in males so uh, the objects can be uh, shoes gloves uh, like any undergarments or stockings and it is not diagnosed if the sexual object is wearing clothes of the opposite sex because then it becomes a fetishic transvestism and uh, other like uh, if you're uh, like uh, if masturbation is there or using a vibrator is there again then 
it is not considered as a fetishism because uh, that is again we have considered it under normal and uh, fetishism is often associated with masturbation but masturbation in itself is not abnormal oh yeah bula do kya okay fine fine it is good bhaiya ko bula we don't know when stings in bites here okay so coming to sadism uh here the patient who is uh, doing the act is called a sadist so sadist is a person who is sexually aroused by physical or psychological humiliation uh, suffering la 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 theek hai so here the patient a uh, patient is actually causing some humiliation so some psychological harm suffering or injury on the sexual partner so the partner is the victim and uh, the person li- likes to inflict some pain some psychological or physical pain on the victim and again mostly uh, done by males though it is not very essential but mostly males are the ones uh, who are sadists and the methods used can range anything from tying beating burning cutting stabbing and like we have uh, seen before so rape also comes it can go as uh, extreme as killing also so yes this is uh, quite a worrisome paraphilia masochism is the reverse so here the patient is sexually aroused by physical or psychological humiliation or suffering or injury inflicted on self by others so they need someone uh, they need their partner to inflict pain on them to humiliate them and after uh, they feel pain and humiliation then they are sexually aroused so this is what uh, masochism is and most often masochist is a female again uh, no, nothing hard and fast but mostly it is a female who is a masochist so methods used are the same as that we have seen in sadism uh, only there is a role reversal and to be called as a disorder it should be persistent and significant mode of sexual arousal so the patient does not get arousal due to other techniques and needs just the pain to be present to go through a sexual activity and uh, sexual sadism and masochism are often seen in the same individual and are on a continuum so uh, they might have had somebody inflicting pain on them and after that they feel that yes they should also inflict pain on some other person to get sexually aroused so the same person can have both these tendencies and uh, if that is there then it is ca- uh, called as a sadomasochism especially this is there in icd 10 now exhibitionism so exhibitionism is a persistent or recurrent significant method of sexual arousal by exposure of one's genitalia to an unsuspecting stranger so usually they will uh, again mostly males so they would like to uh, show their genitalia to other people and after showing this they get sexual arousal and it is usually followed by masturbation to achieve orgasm exclusively seen in males and unsuspecting stranger can be a female a child or adult so the victim can be uh, anybody but mostly it is uh, seen in males and males alone then voyeurism so voyeurism is the opposite of exhibitionism or uh, here the patient needs to see somebody who is either uh, naked or undressing or doing some sexual activity so by watching other people they get a sexual arousal so this is known as voyeurism and uh, because of this they are called as peeping tom and again it is followed by masturbation to achieve orgasm and usually the people who are being observed uh, they don't know or they are not aware in exhibitionism the person is also aware to whom they are exposing but here the people do not know that they are being watched or something so uh, that is what leads to sexual arousal in this uh, 
in these cases or in voyeuristic people and uh, again here watching pornography is not included uh, whatever the patient is uh, seeing or uh, patient is watching somebody is watching in real life so uh, they have excluded pornography out of this now coming to the next one next is uh, fracturism so here there is a persistent or recurrent involvement in the act of touching and rubbing against an unsuspecting person so these uh, people people who are suffering from this paraphilia they need to uh, touch or rub against uh, some non consenting person to get a sexual arousal and uh, because this is possible very easily in crowded places uh, like buses or crowded markets so usually what they'll do is they'll prefer traveling by buses or they'll prefer places which are very crowded so that they can uh, go and just unsuspectingly or unconsentingly uh, touch these people and if it occurs in a crowded place the victim also does not uh, protest because they just feel that it's part of a crowd so they cannot suspect uh, that uh, some act is getting carried out here uh, more commonly seen in young males adolescent males so this is what is fracturism now uh, pedophilia so yes this has been uh, gaining uh, more and more awareness uh, currently so you should know the definition because there are a lot of medical legal implications in the cases of pedophilia so when is pedophilia defined or how is it defined again persistent and recurrent involvement of an adult so the definition of adult is anybody more than 16 years of age usually adults we define as more than 18 years but for pedophilia we have lowered it to 16 years or 5 years older than the child so if the child is 5 years of age and the perpetrator or the pedophilic is 11 12 years of age again that is considered under pedophilia so it's a very strict guideline and if these criteria are being fulfilled by the adult and they are engaging in sexual activity with prepubertal children again children are defined as less than 18 years of age so either heterosexual or homosexual but if they are involved with a child then it is called as pedophilia usually there is some component of sadism also and this behavior may be either limited to incest or may spread to children outside the family so what we have seen in most cases of pedophilia the perpetrator is a uncle or some uh, relative with whom the child is comfortable also so when uh, it is done by somebody who is related to the child then it comes under incest but it can be some other person also and in most civilized society pedophilia is a serious offense and the convicted pedophile's name remains on a sex offenders list and uh, so that everybody is just uh, aware that this is a pedophilic person and in india we have pocso act so it is prevention of sexual abuse against children act so uh, whoever person commits this act is then uh, convicted under the pocso act so this was about pedophilia zoophilia or what is also known as bestiality it is a persistent and significant involvement in sexual activity which with animals so this is rare but whenever animals are involved in sexual activity then it is called as bestiality or zoophilia like i've told you there is a long list of other uh, paraphilias also so the less common ones like uh, sexual arousal with urine is called as urophilia with feces is coprophilia with enemas is klismaphilia and with copsis is necrophilia so maybe in your uh, neat or next whatever exam is going to be there uh, mcqs can be asked about these paraphilias so they'll give you a description and they'll ask you what is the type of paraphilia or they'll ask you the type of paraphilia and in the options you will be uh, asked to describe what it is so having an idea about this is uh, important even if you don't see cases mcqs are very commonly asked in these uh, areas 
then uh, one interesting uh, thing is asphyxophilia so here enhancement of sexual experience occurs by cutting off blood flow through the brain so the patient uh, or the person strangulates himself or herself so that blood flow is cut and then they have an enhanced sexual experiences usually performed during masturbation but yes if you are cutting the blood flow then a lot of other problems can occur and the most dangerous of them uh, is cardiac arrest and uh, estimated death rates according to APA is one person per year per million of population so a lot of deaths do occur due to asphyxophilia so this is another paraphilia now uh, I've just uh, compiled all the causes of all the paraphilias so uh, any type of paraphilia why does this occur it can occur if there is inability to ac uh, access the normal sexual outlet so the patient is not able to go through a normal uh, sexual intercourse or what is the normal process so if they're not able to go then they focus on other things like non-living objects and all so this is one theory Another theory is that early sexual fantasies may be repeatedly reinforced uh, through masturbation and then this uh, ultimately results in paraphilia. So there are some fantasies and the patient is giving in to these fantasies or encouraging these fantasies and then they can lead to uh, such paraphilias. Some people say that uh, it can be due to biological causes because it is seen mostly in males so they say that higher testosterone can uh, be one of the causes then there are some learning views so they say that experimental uh, they say that fetishes can be conditioned so they have done a lot of experiments and they have also taken clinical histories and they have seen that fetishes are learned so they learn how to do this and this learned behavior becomes part of their normal behavior now treating is easier said than done it is a uh, very very challenging very complicated uh, full cure i don't know if it is possible also but uh, we have to try so what can we do we can do either psychoanalysis and psychoanalytical psychotherapy so if the patient is psychologically minded patient is cooperative patient has good ego strength then we can do this type of therapy because it involves a lot of cooperation from the patient also. Uh, the patient tells their childhood experiences and then uh, work through is done in probably 9-10 months of therapies. So because it's such a long drawn process, a lot of patience is required from the patient also and from the therapist also. Behavior therapy is easier comparatively to psychoanalysis. So in behavior therapy, there is aversion therapy and it is the treatment of choice in severe distressing paraphilias. But here also the patient should give consent. But if the patient is not psychologically minded, aversion therapy is good. So what is done in aversion therapy? Like for example, if they have a fetish for shoes again. So what they're done is they are shown a picture of shoe and then given a small current or a small painful stimulus so what happens is that shoe gets conditioned with a painful stimulus so whenever they think about shoe they don't get a sexual arousal they remember the electric shock it's a very small shock which is given or they remember the pain which was inflicted so this can help in decreasing the paraphilic behavior some drugs are there and like I've told you, there's no cure, so you can't uh, give a drug like an antibiotic and cure it like an infection. But sometimes we can give antipsychotics because if there is a lot of aggression uh, related with the paraphilia, then antipsychotics can work. So in this we can give. And benperidol was earlier believed to be useful but uh, now it is not used not given so that's not important but we use a lot of anti-androgens like we have seen that probably uh, high testosterone might be a cause for paraphilias so if we give a drug which will decrease the testosterone or decrease all the androgens it might be used 
so the sexual activity uh, at least comes down but uh, again it's not a cure so depending upon the patient you can give antipsychotics you can give anti androgens at least uh, try any or uh, some type of therapy which might work usually we give a combination of drugs and psychotherapy but uh, again very very challenging to treat these cases so i would just like to conclude that it is important to understand that not all paraphilias are harmful or distressing to the individual so if the individual are able to incorporate in a healthy and consensual way then it is not abnormal but if there is distress harm or impairment in functioning either to self or to others then it is cl clinically significant it requires some intervention some uh, treatment which is possible but uh, it is abnormal and treatment should be started as soon as possible okay so with this we finish paraphilias uh, any doubt any anecdote which you would like to share or any doubt which any of you have